Okay, so here we are. We're talking here, and then we'll put the screen up. But uh, so you all are getting really good at uh, better at uh, jumping in there, and um, I'll open up the chat. But I now I only have one screen tonight, today two screens. So, but um, hey, there's Ellie. Um, so. Anyway, the, the, what I'm, what I, the point I was making was we're, we're going to go where we go in this 50 minutes, and that will be the official record of what happened today. Okay. So I may have to steer the discussion a little bit. Let me share, but I hope, because it's harder for you just to, I can't see your faces. I mean, I can't see a quizzical look or, you know, you can't just kind of raise your hand. You can, I guess, but. So it's a little bit harder. <clears throat> so my, this company, okay, we're sharing that now. So this company I've started called Ask Me Tutoring. And uh, we, right now we're just doing ACT, SAT, PSAT reviews. And if you're a junior, you probably got an email from us. But um, for the one coming up in February, the ACT. But uh, there's, what we're looking ultimately to do is to teach just through this method through, but more interactive, like they're getting more and more like the breakout rooms and stuff, but they're getting more and more animations and, and then the student can control the board. And so it's getting to be much better. Um, and the bandwidth's going towards it. So I think what's gonna boom, it's already starting to boom is remote learning. Uh, I know it sucks compared to live, but sometimes you can't do live. If you're if you're in Godibo, Oklahoma, you can't you know go take a physics class. Only fifteen percent of the districts in Oklahoma offer physics. So this would be a way to teach. It's, we have a nonprofit group that we're, it's a nonprofit company, but you know you still get a salary. But this is the way to teach. And so I heard a story on a on a group. It's the last thing I'll say. On a group called OutSchool, and it's out of uh, California. And last year, teaching remotely, now they're for profit. They made a hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars. So that, what that point is, is that you could do this method that we're doing right now. And you all have shown me you got A's. I mean, you know, with Facebook, and you know, Sophia's good, Eric's good, Brandon's good. So people are starting to get on there and ask questions. And kind of hold me accountable uh, and it does sometimes take me a while to answer because i don't always look at facebook but you can always remember if an hour's gone by text my number 405-760-8425-405-760-8425 oh great i just said it hold it stop i can't i got i gotta stop good grief oh well i hope they don't hear that i just recorded that publicly wonderful Anyway, text me, and uh, um, and then I, hopefully nobody watches this but us. Text me, and uh, I'll just put QFA, Q, QFA, and then I'll know to go to Facebook. Okay, so through a combination of stuff, we can do it. So I went around the class, and I gave uh, dogs uh, four. 4.3, which does not affect you. You're not 4.4. You're not going to turn in for you, you are going to turn in 4.4. You're not going to submit it. I'm going to post the key. And I apologize. I did not post the key to 4.2 like I was supposed to yesterday. I'll post that today. And I'll post the key to 4.4 today. So hopefully you're keeping up. That's all symbol work. And it, I'll have a detailed key. All right. So just letting you know, so next week, there'll be something else you'll turn in. It won't be 4.4. And then that will be your one sheet a week where you'll get all those dog points, stamp points. Yes, we worked a bunch of them in here. This is your homework for the weekend is the practice problems, as a lot of you are already working on. Um, and I'm starting to get questions in class too. We had kids waiting at lunch and we're got, so now we're working on this, this is good. Now try and get these done this weekend. I know it's a long weekend, but I think Monday or Tuesday, uh, come the, the next set comes out. So um, you can do two a day, you'd be fine. Uh, it's not just, 
like you're not getting credit though for just practicing. He doesn't give you credit. You have you, your credit's going to come when you take the test, uh, and you're going to get some credit from just the chicken scratches. And so you can make it as sloppy as you want. Uh, just work the problem. Um, you have to. There's no PDFs of this. Okay, it's just right. You can just screenshot it on Facebook and print it off if you want to print it off that way. Maybe what I'll do though, I'll make it one page so you don't have to keep going to different, to different posts. Like put one page on the, which all, all six questions, you can just print off one page rather than having to screenshot, screenshot, screenshot. See what I'm saying? So maybe I'll do a PDF where I squeeze them all into one and I put that. Maybe I'm trying to save space on Canvas. All right, so keep asking questions about that. So I showed the video from last year. Let me show you something. Let's see, I'm gonna stop the share. And let me share you another screen. Let me share this screen. Okay. Oh, and show you, I don't know if I can do it. I had, I shared that with the kids, but it was, hmm, it was, um, what my classroom looked like last year when we were going over this uh circular motion and oscillations and stuff uh i i videotaped them okay let's show up i videotaped everybody and um just in class just for lunch typical lunch and just the nature of that was pretty amazing it's not showing up all right don't worry about it no more time for that anyway. All right, back to work. So I thought I could quickly quickly show you that. All right, so back to this. Maybe I'll put it in the comments section. So we up again? Is it working? Remote yes. control. Okay, so you see that screen. All right, so then Tuesday, we'll do the rocketry thing outside if the weather's okay. And here we go. So we, yesterday we talked about the, the you know, frying pan going back and forth, that's oscillations. And then we did the thing with the wheel or I talked about the wheel. Uh, and that's what I was, that's why, I, that's why I was going to this thing goes to show it. I have a video for you guys, which shows the wheel. So I'll keep looking for that and I'll put those up. I think I've got to put videos in the comments underneath these screenshots. So I put two up there yesterday. I'll put a bunch more animations up there tonight. This was, that was second hour. Uh, that was, this is you guys. So this is where we ended yesterday. We came up with an equation for oscillations. All right. Now, Mr. Askey. Yes. We can't see your iPad. We okay, didn't see okay. the MacBook. That's what I MacBook. thought. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You see what? Hold on a minute. Your MacBook. Oh. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's probably not good. iPhone, iPad via cable. Okay. Now, there you go. Thank you. Okay, so so there we go. Uh, this is what we ended yesterday. So if this is time, and, uh, then this, and then you probably need some notes today. We're not really going to work on a worksheet. We're not. We, we, I know we're going to do 4.5 eventually, but we're not working on that yet. So, because one of my, one of the things for physics is I'm supposed to show you, we're supposed to talk about waves and vibrations. That's one of the standards. So this, from peak to peak, when the pattern repeats, this, if this is a time axis, this is the period, TP, okay? But uh, what if this is a, not not the time axis but it's in the position versus versus a and in that case we have what's called wavelength it's a wavelength and so it's in the order of depending on like waves in the ocean you know might be two meters apart or five meters apart uh sound waves are um maybe on the order of micrometers apart don't quote me on that but sound waves that come out of my, I'll show you an animation of that in a minute, but they come out of my mouth. Uh, electromagnetic waves are on the order of nanometers apart usually. 
So the symbol for wavelength is lambda, lowercase lambda, like, you know, lambda chi for a fraternity, but this is lowercase lambda, and that's for wavelength. And so if your body loves uh, this, your body loves 800 nanometer wavelength. You love being hit by 800 nanometer wavelength because that's infrared. That causes your molecules, your skin molecules to vibrate and it feels good to you. So that's, that's the order we're talking about because heat is, I mean, IR, infrared, is electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so heat is a form of electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so let's keep going. Kind of going through some of the... All right, so what, what got me talking about this was Jacob uh, Sheldon, who used to be with you guys, at the end of class, now he's in, in third hour, at the end of third hour, he came up to me yesterday and said, so if we were to plot the X and the Y versus T, would that be a corkscrew through time, three-dimensional corkscrew? And I said, yes. And so that got me thinking about, um, okay, that got me thinking about electromagnetics. So here we go. We're going to do a little electromagnetics 101, and that'll be the bulk of what we're going to talk about. But I'll just cut myself off at two. Okay, so originally, uh, remember that it was Ben Franklin that figured out the idea of a running a current. Um, he did the famous kite, right? 1750, uh, before the American Revolution. But he was a scientist. And he, he, he didn't do, by the way, he did not do the key, and the wire, and the kite during a storm. Uh, if he had done that, then not good. He did it when the, when the air was starting to be electrified before the storm got there. Uh, and then notice the uh, arc that came from the key and saw that electricity went down the wire. So that was the first time we've done that. So in many ways, he's sort of the father of electricity, Ben Franklin. A guy, I forget this guy, this guy's name's lost, but uh, he, I forgot it anyway. He came in a couple years later trying to recreate Ben Franklin's kite experiment. And he did it, but he made the mistake of doing it during a storm. <laughs> and so lightning bolts hit it and they said all they found of him was they found like a like charcoal, his shoes were blown off, his head was blown off, and because the lightning bolt hit him. So be careful what you do with electricity. So if you walk outside right now, I notice there's some clouds up there. It's probably around 10,000 volts between you, between the top of your head and the clouds. But air is a really good insulator. And depending on how much, hum how much humidity there is, but air doesn't allow current to flow through it very well. If it does, it arcs. Sometimes it does. You're, you're, you've got your socks out of the drawer, out of the dryer, and you're separating them. If you ever do that, you should do it in the dark. And you'll see little sparks. That's electrons actually arcing, making the jump. But it's really hard to get to the right gap, right? Like a spark plug, I said the right gap. Anyway, so there is 10,000 volts on you when you walk outside today. There's a cloud base. Once that voltage, that voltage is simply a push. It's not current. But once that voltage reaches a million around there and the cloud base is low enough, you will get struck by lightning. So that's, so all these ideas were kicking around in people's heads. Of course, the American Revolution came along and, and it kind of slowed everybody down. But then we got, they got back after it about the early 1800s. Thomas Young experiments, some other people. And then you got Orsted, you got Amper, you got Volta. Okay, one of the top 10 experiments of all time, bolted, messing with frog legs. And so all of this started working. Then you get Faraday. So Faraday was the, Faraday had very little math. He didn't understand the calculus to save his life. He could barely get algebra, but he was a visual guy. And so he was a great experimentalist. He loved to do experiments. And so he started in draw, very visual drawing. So he started thinking about electricities and wires and how it throws off and a magnet, a compass is, you know, is reflected by it. So originally back in 1850 or so, 1840, they thought that there's this thing called electricity. Okay, Ben Franklin got us there. There's this thing called magnetism and they known about magnetism since magnetite, right? So they known about magnetism since the BC days, but they didn't think they were, they were connected. It was Faraday that started showing that they, 
one gives you the other. And he said this, of course, he's laughed out of the whole auditorium because this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't have a PhD. Um, that's why I love Faraday. He was just a common man who just thought and just tried, you know, and he was also really good at relating. He would do these candlelight lectures at Christmas time to kids. And they're like, some. They're, they're, I've heard they were some of the most amazing because uh, he could really relate and, and put it in their words and turned a whole generation on to science. Anywho, so uh, Faraday um, thought that electricity and magnetism were somehow related. Uh, he, it wasn't until James Clerk Maxwell. So let's come along here. Now, this will be our electricity, which is, um, okay, so here's my electricity. My pure electricity, and that's not the best sine wave, but, okay. Let's say that's just, a, a, the black will be electricity. And what, what Faraday saw was, if you run a current through a wire, there is a magnetic field created. And later he found that if I have a magnetic field, I can make electricity. If I have good, strong magnets, I can make wires move and that he invented the motor. Okay, hold on. So this, if you have electricity, this is where I, and I have animations of this, I'll show you animations. But if, if you can think of this, if, that, if electricity is like that, then magnetism is perpendicular to electricity. There's a magnetic wave that's also produced and it comes out of the page and then back into the page and then out of the page, et cetera, et cetera. Same wavelength, same, same amplitude though. So this blue is magnetic, magnetism. Magnetism, okay. Um, and so it turns out, Faraday was laughed at a lot. Of course, you're always laughed at when you have new ideas, but when you have paradigm shifts, people laugh at you, just get ready. Uh, all right, so this is out of uh, screen, and this is into screen. So there's a much better that I'll that I'll put in the I'll put in the screenshots and I'll put I'll put a couple of good videos. They're fairly short, but they're good animations. Uh, so this is something worth watching later on into the screen. Okay, so it's so when you have one, you have the other, and this all came from Jacob asking that one question. So electricity is really a bit of magnetism and a bit of that's why it's called E and it's called EM electromagnetic. And so they, they realized after Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell that those were really the two, that they thought they were two different forms of energy. They thought there was like gravity, there's electricity, there's magnetism, and that's it. That's all they knew about. They didn't know about strong nuclear force. That wasn't until, um, you know, Rutherford uh, and Chadwick in the, in the 19, early 1900s. They didn't, know about, they didn't know about weak nuclear force. Good grief. That wasn't until Lee Smeitner and people like that. So um, they just knew about electricity, magnetism, and gravity. That, that was it. That's all there was. But the, then they, the freak out was that E and M are connected to each other. One goes this way, one goes this way. And so they but, but they always, okay, and this is what, so Maxwell was a bit younger. He's quite a bit younger than Faraday. He died, unfortunately, he was 48. But Max, if Maxwell hadn't died at 48, who knows where we'd be right now? He was, a, he was a brilliant Scotsman. And he developed a friendship with Faraday and worked. He was the mathematician. He knew math backwards and forwards, and he was using Faraday's data. And so Faraday later on in life got dementia. And um, he, they, they, you know, by then he was, he was famous enough where they kind of took care of him. But Maxwell would visit him. And one time Maxwell visited him and said, Michael, we figured it out. You were right the whole time. You were laughed at, but you were right the whole time. Electricity and magnetism are related. And the cool thing is, he said, they are, these are stitched together. 
they're stitched together. Always. If you have electricity, you have magnetism. In magnetism, you have electricity. This is modern day motors. That's how all electricity works, by the way. Uh, generators, all this comes out, of, comes out of Faraday's work. So he said they're stitched together. Um, in other words, a little bit of magnetism will create a little bit of electricity. And then the little electricity will create a little bit more magnetism. And then back and forth and back and forth. And what, what Maxwell said was, in his Scottish accent, he said, Michael, it's a never ending braid. It's a never ending braid. Braid. That they, like, like you're braiding hair, like it's braided together. Electricity and magnet always stuck with me. Never ending braid. And he said, that, here's the thing though. He said, There's a, there is, this only happens at one speed. This speed of stitching, the stitch, like a sewing machine, the speed of stitching electricity and magnetism together only happens, it only happens at one speed. Anyone want to try it? What speed is that? Only happens at one speed. It is two. 0.99 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Do you know what that is? That, my friends, is the speed of light. That is the speed of light. That's the, the, the speed of light is the speed at which magnetism and electricity stitch themselves together. The more you look into physics, the cooler it gets. It's like that's electricity, not just electricity. <laughs> that's all electromagnetism, including light. That and you know Einstein. That's why Einstein fell in love with James Clerk Maxwell because Einstein, even as a five-year-old, was fascinated by light, and Maxwell understood light. And Maxwell was died at 48, or he might have lived at the same time Einstein. That would have been wacko. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So if you follow a particle on, the, on this um, electromagnetism, the, a particular particle will go in a corkscrew. So light, when light comes at you, it comes at you in a corkscrew, okay? In a corkscrew manner. You can put on polarized lenses and you can, it's like picket fence. You only get some of that. And so it can keep out some of the frequencies and all. Um, polarized light. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay, all right. So now, so let's keep going here. What time I got? Okay, I'm good. So if we, if we go, if we look at light um, and it's in the, let's say it's 650. Now give your, on this little drawing, give yourself, maybe turn your paper sideways and give yourself a long, long, the long axis. This is gonna get kind of big. And I'll put nice screenshots up here, but I wanna go, I wanna kind of discover it with each other. That's the fun part about it, right? Learning. So if I have wavelength that is um, on the order of my lambda is on the order of uh, from here to here, if that lambda is, okay, I'll go far extreme, 700. Let's say it's 700 nanometers and it's electromagnetic, okay? If it's 700 nanometers, now what I told you, I said, you like, you like 800 nanometers, your body does. So a little longer, when it's a little longer wavelength, you like that because that you feel that as heat, 800 nanometers. Don't quote me on these numbers. I'm giving you ballparks. But when it's 800 nanometers, when it's 700 nanometers, you're just starting to, okay, turn on a stove. If you turn a stove on, you turn on low, 
you don't know it's on, right? Very dangerous. Put your hand over it and you can feel the heat. But if you turn it to medium high, if you have an old coil stove, what color pops up finally? Red. Red. So 700, that means that the electromagnetic waves that are coming at your eyes are 700 to 650 nanometers in width from peak to peak. Below that is IR or infrared or heat, right? Uh, it, it radiates in all directions from a fire or whatever. Um, and then you keep going, Roy G. Bibb, right? Red, orange, yellow. So Roy, I think you learned this in probably middle school, Roy G. Bibb. I was listening to this group called Boards of Canada and they have a song called Roy G. Bibb. I thought, oh my God, just last night. So you keep going and the wavelength, the, the lambda keeps getting smaller and smaller. And finally you get to violet light and that wavelength is about 400 nanometers. So the human eye, see that's higher frequency. So it's not a higher amplitude necessarily. Amplitude on light, amplitude on light waves is intensity, how bright the light is. So when you have your light on your phone, you hit, you turn the brightness up, you're not affecting the frequency, you're affecting the amplitude. Okay, hold on, hold on. Or in sound, of course, amplitude is volume, frequency is pitch. But in light, amplitude's intensity. So this is 400 nanometers, which is a little tighter. Okay, now that's a little tighter. Okay, well, who came up with this Roy G. Biv? What do you think? I'll give you a chance to guess this one. Who developed Roy G. Biv? This came out of Isaac Newton. Whenever I ask those kind of questions, just go 50 50, man. It's either Isaac Newton or it's Einstein, or it's Faraday, or it's Galileo. That's like Isaac Newton. Yeah, late 1600s, say 1680s. And I, you know, I could be off by 10 years. It doesn't matter in that time frame. So Isaac Newton, the first thing he noticed, he, had, he shares this in common with Einstein. He was fascinated by light. You know why? Because he was a sickly child. He laid in bed. His dad was long gone by the time he was born. He hated his dad. I think his dad died. His dad was a farmer. He didn't hate his dad. No, he didn't hate his dad. He hated his mother. He used to dream of his mother burning alive. Um, I, you know, uh, uh, Newton was a bit of a strange kid. Um, he had a kind of a horrible childhood. But um, he would lay in bed. He was sickly a lot. Uh, he would lay in bed and he would watch the light come through the, come through the slats of the walls of the old shack they lived in. They weren't rich. Um, the, in, this is in Lincolnshire. And so he would notice that the light would be at certain places during the time of day. And he invented a clock. He invented a light clock. He invented it because where the shadows were, even as a six, seven year old kid. And so the people in town would come by and ask him what time it was. <laughs> How much time do we have for the sun goes down? He could look at his shadows. He had it all marked off. He said, okay, you got about an hour you know, before the sun goes down. Anyway, so he was fascinated by light, but he's the, so the Pink Floyd album, you know, that has the prism and then has the light come in and then it bends into all the colors. That was Isaac Newton. Um, I think he played bass for Pink Floyd. <laughs> no, so Isaac Newton. And so he, uh, he realized that white light was made up of all these different colors. Um, and he started looking them over. He, you know what he did? Okay, here's a side note. He wanted, to, he, he wanted to understand how human eyes pick up light. And so with the common thing back then, more in the Da Vinci days, but the common thing was you could pay somebody 20 quid and they'd go dig up a body for you and bring you a body, fresher the better, right? But then they could kind of look at it. You could, so they had, they had got, I mean, Da Vinci, you know, they had already dissected the human eye. But Newton wanted to know what's happening to the eye with light. How is the eye... When light comes into the eye, how does I, the eye ter interpret that? So he took a bobkin, like a sewing needle, and he took it and he jammed it into his eye. Um, 
he he would have done it on a cadaver, but that's not going to help him. I guess he couldn't get anybody to volunteer. So he said, plus it wouldn't help him to have a kid volunteer or something to do it because um, he had a lot of friends. So because um, he wanted to know what that did. So he took that bobkin and he stuck it in his eye. Now he put it in, don't do this, please. He took it in the side of his eye and then worked his way back into his eye and then kind of racked it all around back in there. And like he was tripping, right? Because all kinds of colors are coming up and aberrations. And, um, and so he from there realized there's some kind of rods and cones. He, he's not the one that invented those words, but that the eye interprets the light as it comes in and has, I'll, if I remember, I'll put the diagram uh, in, the, in the screenshots of, from, from Newton's notes. Um, but so, so he realized, so, so, so light is made up into Roy G. Biv. Uh, one of the things, so Roy G. Biv, right? One of these colors doesn't exist and the color doesn't exist is indigo. There's no such thing as indigo, no such thing. Einstein, uh, Einstein you know, Newton made it up. You know why, you know why Newton made up indigo? Anybody ever read this? Why would you just, we'll just leave it at six? Why you gotta go seven, huh? Why you gotta be so difficult? You know why? Because Newton read the Bible a lot more than he studied physics and seven is a sacred number. And so he made up indigo to have seven primary colors. So let's keep going. So then if we go above um, ultra, if we go, if we go above violet, what's that called? Ultra, right? Ultra means above. So ultraviolet, UV light. And UV light, now don't quote me on this one. UV light were really high frequencies. I don't know what the cutoff is. I know around 400 nanometers, you're looking at violet. So probably 300 nanometers in that range. So it's even tighter, really getting high frequency. And by the way, frequency. Okay, let's throw it out there. Frequency. Like I said, this is a wide ranging discussion. It's better if you're there and you can ask questions. <laughs> anyway, we, it doesn't play as well on Zoom. Frequency is the symbol for frequency. I hate this, but the symbol is new in you. And new, the symbol is this. And that looks like a V to kids. And so I, I used to do it that way. And then I got so many kids that thought I was talking about velocity. I'm not I'm talking about frequency. Frequency is cycles per second. It's the inverse of period. Period is seconds per cycle. TP, period, is seconds per cycle. Frequency, nu, is cycles per second. Now I don't use this V, I use a curly F for frequency. Okay, this is what ASCII uses. But in textbooks, you'll see it as new. Okay, because the textbook can be careful how they show it, but just drawing on the board, people think it's a V. So freak, these are the frequencies. So I'm giving so I'm giving you wavelengths, and wavelength and frequency are related. Um, C over lambda, C over lambda is new in electromagnetics for E and M, for EM. C, lowercase c is speed of light. I never understood why C, why lowercase c was the chosen symbol for speed of light. Why don't you call it sped or call it S or, and the reason is it stands for celeritas and celeritas means swift. which we will learn from our movie. Okay, um, so when you go above UV, now UV, we have ABC, right? We got now one of those, they, they cause cancer. It's how you get your suntan, UV light. Uh, it kills um, germs. Uh, we have a UV light oven in my room and I throw the visa markers in there and then we, we zap them overnight. So we have clean ones, you know, the next day. You know, you could use UV light, if you put it inside your body, 
<laughs> you can kill germs, man. <laughs> you got to give it to Trump, man. Trump, Trump is, he's brainstorming on national TV. Oh man, I thought that was hilarious. I mean, I, I feel for him. He's just trying to come up with solutions in that case, but oh my gosh, what a firestorm. I actually felt sorry for him on that one. I mean, come on, give the guy a break. He's just trying to think, maybe we could do this. Uh, bleach, bleach, when you put bleach in the book. <laughs> uh, they blew that out of proportion. All right, anyway, so UV light, and then we go above UV light. Now even higher, someone tell me, what's higher frequency than UV light? What do you got? Give me something higher frequency than that. Electromagnetic wave. Cat got your tongue? Give me something. Don't chat because I don't I don't see the chat. You gotta say it. Oh, you're waiting for points. Okay. Uh two points. Somebody tell me what's above UV light. Anything above UV light. X-rays. X-rays, you say. Is that what you said, Miranda? X-rays? Yeah. Okay. X-rays are up there. They're above it. X-rays. And this is all stuff we talked about in class, so I'm not just going off on tangents here. This is actually more organized. <laughs> X-rays are from a guy named um, their Willem, Wilhelm Röntgen. Röntgen. Rönt, Röntgen. In fact, German, he was German. Germans call them Röntgen waves. We call them X-rays because it's all, this is something called serendipity. You know what serendipity is? I have a book named Serendipity. You know what that is? You uh, Aegis English people should know this. What's serendipity? Really? Nobody knows? Serendipity is when you discover something accidentally. And it turns out that, so discovered, that means discovered accidentally. And it turns out that a lot of science is serendipitous. You all think that science is these guys in white coats that all have a plan. They don't have a plan, especially back in 1800s, 1700s, 1600s. There's no plan. They, something kept, they kept happening and finally figured it out. I mean, that's, this is what happened to Röntgen. Röntgen was looking at Crookes tubes, which are these cathode ray tubes. That was the cool thing of the day. And he noticed he had photographic plates. He would take pictures of things. He had photographic plates in drawers. And he would come in the next morning and have that tube on, come in the next morning, and the plates had developed, but they're in a drawer. You go, what the, for a long time, he's like, what, this is irritating. These photographic plates are bad. I got ripped off. I'm gonna call Amazon. You know, so, so he, um, he uh, uh, finally, said, wait a minute, I think maybe that tube has got something to do because when I turn the tube off at night, I don't get that, it doesn't happen. So finally realized there's a connection there. He said, there's some kind of invisible rays that are coming out of this tube that are going through the wood of the drawer and, and affecting this photographic plate. And so he, he volunteered his wife <laughs> and he, he put his wife, they put the tube, they had his wife put her hand down and then zapped her, and then and then 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 they put a plate underneath that, and they, <laughs> the bones. He, he looked the bones. He see this is a famous photographic plate. And I'll put that in there. The bones of his wife, of his wife's hand. That's the first X-ray. Was the bones of his wife's hand? You can see her ring. Uh, and it was like, can you imagine? You see bones of people because the flesh. It can't, the x-rays can't go through the bone, but they can go through the flesh. And so you all, so it reveals all your bones. Um, Röntgen called him. He just said, these are what the heck? So what the heck? And so he said, I'm just going to, I'll call him something. And so he put X right there for a while. So I'll just put an X for there for now until I think of a name. And so the name stuck, x-rays. That's what we call x-rays. The Germans, like I say, they call them Röntgen waves. Named after Röntgen. Uh, okay. Uh, his wife's hand. 
See, all this stuff comes from just learning a little bit about electromagnetism. I mean, it's, a, it's important to get, because if all we do is look at oh, the ball went up and then it hit a cat and then it came, I mean, it's kind of cool, but you gotta, you gotta spice it up every once in a while. Okay, what's above x-rays? Somebody give me the next one. Say it again. Gamma rays. Gamma rays. Thank you. Give yourself a point. Gamma is, this is gamma. Gamma rays. And that, gamma rays is a whole category of waves. And I don't even want to guess what we're looking at as far as wavelength, but really tight. I need to look this up. Um, gamma rays, gamma. Gamma rays are just plain deadly. <laughs> The good thing about gamma rays are if you put lead, it'll stop it. It'll stop a gamma ray. Um, that's, you need about seven inches thick, though. That's the problem. Um, when the dentist gives you, does x-rays, they give you that lead apron, and that's about an inch thick or maybe half inch thick. That's enough for x-rays, but not enough for gamma rays. Um, so gamma rays, you need some kind of a nuclear explosion. You need a star. You need a gamma burst. Okay, there are gamma ray, there are gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts in the in the universe. And if a gamma ray burst hits us, we'll have no idea it's coming because it's moving at the speed of light. All by the way, all this stuff moves at the speed of light. It has to, right? Because 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 uh, Maxwell showed it to Fa to Faraday that the only way this the only way this stuff stitches together is at the speed of light. Um, so gamma ray bursts, when they hit us, it might hit us in, two, in five minutes and we're gone. That's it. Because gamma ray bursts come from uh, when things explode like large or things collide, uh, it'll put out a gamma ray burst and it wipes out all life. And so if there's a gamma ray burst coming at us, the thing is there's nothing close to, it has to be close. There's nothing close to us. Like within a parsec, okay, within say four or five, say say twenty light years. I'm guessing there. I'm we need to talk to uh, talk to uh, uh, Mr. Pentecost about that. But say a four, say something five light years away explodes, and the gamma ray blast hits us, then we're done. They're extremely extremely high energy. All all molecular walls, all cell walls break down. And you'll just turn into ooze like that. Uh, you might live for five or six minutes, but you'll watch everything melt away. All like life forms melt away. So let's not worry about that, huh? What do you think? Now let's go to the other end of the spectrum. If I go below infrared, what do I have? What's below infrared? Heat. What's below heat? Infraheat? No. What is it? What do we call that? This is called microwaves. Microwaves are like a microwave oven. When I was growing up, we didn't have microwave ovens. When I was in high school, my family got something called a radar range. And it was weird, man. You put something in and it cooked it fast, like much faster than the oven. And I thought, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. My dad's an engineer. And I said, yeah, look, Dad, this must be really hasty. He said, son, that's not high energy at all. It's lower energy. I said, what? Come on, Dad, you're joshing me. No, microwaves are low energy. They're lower than red. They're lower than heat. They're these long wavelength waves. Then how the heck does it heat up your food so fast? I could not get him to. He just, he would shake his head a lot with me. Um, he wasn't a very good explainer. But quiet man. But it turns out, I found out later uh, in college, that microwaves, quantum, it's quantum mechanics. They take the, it's called the J, they take the water molecule and they cause the water molecule to rotate. At that 2,475 megahertz, I believe it is, that causes water to, to rotate. And so when the water rotates, it's friction and it cooks your food from the inside out. 
Uh, and that's why it makes it kind of spongy. It's not, I mean, the, there are things, early radar ranges really were not good. Uh, you can only cook certain things in that. So those are microwaves and we have microwave towers, right? 5G, all this kind of stuff, which is, no, it doesn't hurt you. Uh, there's microwaves in the room right now. Uh, cell phone data, microwaves. And if you go beyond, if you go lower the microwaves, what is that? Way down here. Radio waves. Thank you. Radio waves. And so radio waves, now we're talking, this wavelength can be miles. It can be really high. So radio waves, and I'll show you a video on this uh, in, the, uh, in the comments, but radio waves cause like electrons to vibrate in wires. And once again, this is Marconi, um, this is uh, Tesla, this is people in the late 1800s, um, little J.J. Thompson, because uh, J.J. Thompson didn't discover electrons until 1897. So we're looking early 1900s. Uh, this is uh, Max Planck uh, looking at this electrons doing this called harmonic oscillator. They call them harmonic oscillators. And electrons will vibrate. And you, if you put a wave at a wire or the radio wave, the electrons in the wire will start to bop, 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 vibrate at a certain frequency. And so when you're in the... Um, when you're in the megahertz range, that's FM radio. When you're in the kilohertz range, thousands of hertz, that's AM radio. AM stands for amplitude modulation. You, you bury the signal in the amplitude. And FM stands for frequency modulation. You bury the, you bury the signal in the, in the frequency. I think they came out with that around 1940s, I'm gonna guess. Radar, all that kind of stuff was about the same time. 30s, 40s, okay. Um, 1941, Pearl Harbor. We had radar at that point already. We knew they were coming. Okay, so then radio waves are sort of a general all, and we, this, is how we, this is how we look for alien life. We shoot, you know, Arecibo listens for signals in the radio wave frequency. So if you want to send something a long way, you do it through radio waves. If you want to penetrate things, you do it through gamma rays. Okay. So there is a um, kind of a history. I don't get to talk much history. Uh, last year we talked history a lot, uh, but this year I can hardly get a chance to talk history. So um, that entertained me anyway. Uh, and I'll put I'll, I'll put in the ca captions. I'll put some. Uh, uh, screenshots and stuff, uh, and not just screenshots, but I'll put, I'll put a lot, I'll put like five or six or seven uh, videos and, and animations. I showed the kids in class a bunch of animations from my website. Oh, okay. So since we don't have time to do that, last thing, go to, this is an old website of mine, go to uh, www.ascii.physics dot org org okay and that and then, then look for animations you'll see a, a menu called animations and go down and start looking at those animations i got everything on how machines work uh, you know uh, a lot about waves a lot about electromagnetic waves sound waves and we'll i'll put some of those in the comments also if you're interested in um, higher physics go to uh, www.ascii.ap physics. This is good for next year for you too. And that's .com, .com. And that has both uh, higher level calculus, mechanics, bunch of, there's like a hundred health videos uh, and electromagnetics, the stuff we were talking about. All and a lot of problems worked out for you. So that's in. Uh, ASCII AP. I haven't done much with that in five years, but those are some helpful websites for you guys. But look at the animations on ASCIIphysics.org. Okay, I'm, I'm at my time. All right, guys, you got to go. I got to go. Let me stop sharing. So thank you for indulging me. Uh, screenshot. Oh, well, too late. I'm looking. I'm looking. I see you. I see your buddy. Okay, Miranda, Brady. Brady and Evan, you guys have got to get some icons going. And Michael. Okay, Michael, get some icons going. And Michael, I, I responded to your email. See what you think. Okay, uh, so 
I will talk to you guys not Monday, but Tuesday, because Monday is uh, MLK. Okay. See you all. Have a good weekend, folks.